Nice. All right. Oh, this meeting is being recorded. Got it. All right. Well, hello again. My name's uh, Monica Noble. Um, as she said, I'm from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. I have been um, at CERC for 20 years, although not all of it on the Mudcart Project. Um, I started at um, Smithsonian working on ballast water right after I got my master's. My master's project was on ballast water. So I spent the first 10 years was all about ships, ships and ballast water and um, doing a lot of port sampling around the world. That was in my younger gears with uh, no strings attached and lots of time in my schedule for exciting travel. Um, but starting in around uh, 2014, after my second daughter was born, I took a what was a small project um, that had kind of been run, uh, you know, here and there S since um, 2004, just by a small group of um, staff, whoever, it was kind of the hot potato project, whatever staff member was assigned to that year. And I thought it would be great really to turn that project into a citizen science project. So so I did. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the project has become about um, it, um, about citizen science and about the mud crab and the mud crab parasite that we study. Um, and you'll see from my title slide that there's an awful lot of people on there. Um, those people are scientists, they are um, teachers, they are volunteers, um, because a lot of people over the years have made this project great. Um, you also see at the bottom that we have had um, 13 interns. We usually have at least one intern every year. Um, this year I actually had three. I had um, one college intern and two high school interns. The first time I had high school interns that were actually paid, which was fantastic. So um, the project has allowed for a lot of um, educating of, of folks in addition to just collecting data. All right, so um, an outline. I'm gonna talk, um, I'm going to introduce you to the mud crab and the parasite, as I said before, but I'm also going to focus about half the time on, on citizen science and that aspect of the project and how we transitioned it from sort of the small survey into a citizen science project and how we measured um, data and data collection standards in the context of citizen science. And then I'll give you a sneak peek at some of the um, some of the data analysis that we've done, and um, and some of the ways that citizen science has um, has benefits um, to us, and hopefully you'll hopefully to the scientists, the citizens that come out as well. So the mud crab project. Um, was originally a long-term survey. It was started by Mark Torchin and Greg Ruiz in 2004. And that's coming on 20 years ago. Back then, um, it was a different project. It had 10 sites, 40 crates, and the aim was totally different from what it is now. Their aim was to look at the timing of mud crab reproduction between native crabs here in Maryland and introduced populations in California. Um, in the process of them doing that research, they also um, started collecting data on this introduced crab or this introduced parasite on the crabs. Um, so over time, the project goals changed. And currently, our, our new goal is to understand the abundance and distribution of this introduced parasite called Loxel thylacus panopii and how um, and how the um, crab and parasite relationship changes over time. And as I mentioned earlier, in 2014, so 10 years after the project was initially started by Mark Torchin, um, I took it on and turned it into a citizen science project. And so a second aim is to run, of course, the best citizen science project possible and collect high quality data and have a good experience for our participants. So first, let me introduce you to the mud crabs. Um, 
there are actually five species of mud crabs in Chesapeake Bay. Um, we collect two species in our survey, the white-fingered mud crab, which is Rithropanopius harrisi, and um, one of the four species of black-fingered mud crabs, which is Eurypanopius depressus. I think its common name is flat-backed, and if you've looked at a few thousand crabs, you can maybe distinguish it. It is a little bit flatter, but I think... Uh, you have to look at a lot of crabs in order to pick up that difference, honestly. <laughs> Luckily, there's other characteristics that help us determine which species is what. Eurypanopius um, prefers a bit higher salinity than the white-fingered mud crab. So we tend to find the white-fingered mud crab in lower salinity areas. And as you get down um, near Oxford, Brooms Island um, areas where we survey um, the salinity is a little higher, and so we start getting more of the Eurypanopius depressus in our survey. Um, both of these crabs are abundant, um, and they range in size from the size of a tick to the size of your thumb. So these are small crabs. They are, um, you can see my daughter has, or you will on the next slide. So um, white-fingered mud crab is probably the most abundant um, in our area, in, in Maryland waters of Chesapeake Bay anyway, um, maybe not in Virginia waters, but certainly in Maryland waters are the most abundant. And, um, th but they're also the smallest at less than one inch across. They occur in shallow waters. You can spot them, you know, around oysters, oyster reefs, um, fallen logs, woody debris, under docks, and other submerged structures. And it's not unusual to find, you know, 50 to 100 of these crabs on a single log or even grab of shells that can be quite abundant. And as I love to tell my kids, um, crabs do live in trees, just the part that's underwater. And that's my daughter there picking all the mud crabs out of that um, log that she's pulled out of the river. So um, this is the parasite. Um, the parasite we're looking at is Loxothylacus pinopii. Um, we call it Loxo for short because that's kind of a mouthful. Um, Loxo is a parasitic barnacle and infects nine species of mud crabs, uh, including the Rithropanopius harrisi and the Eurypanopius depressus. Um, it's native to the Gulf Coast and the Caribbean, um, and it was introduced to the East Coast through oyster shipments. As I mentioned, um, these crabs are really common in oysters. And so um, as we were so excited to bring up all these oysters from the Gulf of Mexico in the 1960s up to supplement our oysters in Chesapeake Bay, we kind of brought with them everything that lived on and around those oysters. And so they were first introduced through shipments of oysters around 1964. There's a really interesting paper um, done by a researcher at VIMS. It talks about um, the first discovery of Loxo in Chesapeake Bay and, and describes sort of the refrigerator trucks that they used to bring the oysters um, up from Virginia or from the Gulf um, to Chesapeake Bay and, and dump these oysters out and then with them came the crabs. Now, um, the white-fingered mud crabs are also um, native to the Gulf Coast, but the parasite um, was only in the Gulf Coast. So um, maybe they looked at these crabs and said, oh, it's the same crab we have here, but they didn't look close enough to realize that there was something else coming in with those crabs, with those oysters. Um, so um, don't worry about the tiny print. Uh, um, I don't know how it'll come out on your screen, but um, this is the lifestyle, the life cycle of Loxo. Um, so if I start the life cycle wheel with the cyprid larval stage, um, the tiny female cyprid larvae, and she's like the size of a grain of sand, and she uses this um, kind of dart shaped injection stylet. It's called a stylet. I think it's more like a syringe, kind of acts more like a syringe in my mind. 
She uses it to inject embryonic cells into the crabs, and she does this when the crabs are molting and still soft. Um, so if you've ever felt a soft-shelled crab, you can imagine um, them being vulnerable to sort of being injected um, at that point. So once she's injected these cells into the crab, um, sort of the the parasite, if the now the crab is infected, the crab has an immune system and it's sort of doing like this warfare, trying to fight off the infection like we like any of us would if we had just been infected with a foreign body. But if the parasite wins. Um, it'll take over um, the crab's nervous system and it'll assume complete control over the host crab. It controls all the major functions, molting, reproduction, and it really has a, it kind of compromises the crab's immune system too. And it castrates it, so it totally eliminates the crab's ability to reproduce. So um, further along in that wheel, when the parasite is ready to reproduce, it produces a tiny little sac called a virgin externa, which protrudes through the crab's abdomen. So if you flipped up the flap of a crab, um, you would see that tiny little white sac. And the male cyprid larvae, they look just like the females. Um, they have a syringe of their own. But they are injecting trichogen cells into that sac and they're probably attracted to that sac by chemical cues, I imagine. And when they locate the opening of the, in the externa, they can use their stylet to in inject the trichogen cells. And these develop into testes that fertilize the eggs from within the sac. I mean, that in itself I find fascinating. So once the parasite has grown its testes, it's fully reproductive. And these sacs can now grow really quite large. If you can see from that um, photo on the bottom, they can be huge. Um, and so, um, and under the right conditions, the loxo can produce, you know, a whole new brood every five or six days. So I think because the crab is not in the best of health, it's really got to be quick about it. <laughs> so it's producing thousands of um, thousands of, of larvae. And the first stages of the larvae that are going to come out of those sacs are called the, they're the Nopleus larvae. And they look a lot like the Nopleus of barnacles, um, kind of, you can imagine a spinning little top. But like I say, these are the signs of grains of sand. You really have to have a compound microscope to see them. They're very, very tiny. And they go through several molts of this Nopleus stage. And um, at the last um, Nopleus molt, they'll molt into a cyprid larvae. And then that's the stage that has that syringe that's gonna be looking for either um, the sac of a crab that's already been infected or a soft shell crab, depending on the cyp if the cyprid is male or female. So that's um, how the that's sort of the parasite, how the parasite works. Um, hopefully, hopefully that's clear enough. Um, so what happens to the crab now? <laughs> and now it's got this, now it's got this parasite. So as I mentioned earlier, the parasite assumes complete control over the host crab. It controls when the crab molds, it crassates them. I mean, biologically, they're kind of reproductively dead. So some people have called them like the zombie nursemaids now um, serving this parasite, which is kind of fun to think around Halloween. But uh, they, yeah, they are no longer really part of that um, mud crab system. They're no longer reproductive. Um, and their behavior has changed. So an infected crab, um, will tend that sac of the parasite, just like any female crab would look after her own eggs. But in the case of the parasite, the parasite is an equal opportunist. It's happy with either gender. It's happy with male crabs, happy with female crabs. So in this slide, I've shown you, here's a picture of the male crab. And you can see if you know, um, if you've ever eaten blue crabs or any crab, they have this very narrow little apron. Well, as you saw, these um, these sacs, they can be 
quite big and that's a dainty little apron to try and balance them on. So um, one little trick that the parasite has is she actually causes that apron to widen. Now that next picture in the set, um, that is actually a male crab that's been infected. You can see that virgin externa sort of popping out of that apron, but you can also see that the apron is much wider um, than in the first picture and it's fringy. In fact, it looks a lot like that third picture, which is actually a female crab. And you can see she's a healthy female crab. You can see her swimmerettes there. Swimmerettes are the term for that, those appendages that she'll use to carry her own eggs. Um, that's what her eggs attach to. You can see in that male crab that there are no swimmerettes because um, it's a male, it doesn't carry eggs. <laughs> But um, so once that um, that parasite, not only can she physically change the male crab to make the apron wider, but she also changes his behavior. He now will act just like a female and they call it feminizing the males because he's going to act just like a female crab. He's going to protect and aerate those eggs just like a female crab would. Um, when they aerate the sacs, they basically just move their flap in and out, and that kind of gets water to that sack of parasites, babies. Now, the females are unwittingly taking care of these parasites, too, but because they already are sort of hardwired to, to mother their own eggs, we don't notice that change in behavior that we do when we're looking at the male crabs, because... It really is. It's quite impressive that a parasite can cause not only a physical change, but a behavioral change in its host like this. I find that pretty interesting. Um, so most of the infected crabs that we find, they only have one sac to support. Um, some unfortunate crabs <laughs> have several. And if the crabs have multiple sacs, it's usually like two or three, but sometimes we've seen as many as seven. Um, so here's a few pictures that I took at the microscope where there's just sacs kind of bulging off these poor crabs. Um, it's probably a bit more zoomed in, but um, gives you an idea. And so um, it's always a question, is it, so is a single parasite producing multiple sacs or is it multiple infections? And the answer is we don't know for sure because the early genetic results are, you know, based really on just a few crabs at this point. But the results that, that are there point to multiple parasites rather than multiple sacs, which is quite frightening when you think about um, poor crab. It's probably like having you know, multiple puppeteers kind of fighting con for control over a single puppet, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, there it is, all those sacks on those crabs. So um, now that I've told you a little bit about um, the crabs and the parasites, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I'm going to tell you about our survey. Um, we have um, we have five um, estuaries that we we do our survey in. The Road River, of course, in Edgewater, where Cirque is located. The West River, which is in Galesville, just down the road. Um, Rockhold Creek, which is in Deal. And um, Patuxent Batu uh, River down in Brooms Island. And the Tread Avon River, which is down in Oxford. Now, both Oxford and Tread Avon, those are both higher salinity sites. Um, the ones in Road River, West River, and uh, Rockhold Creek are all lower salinity sites. So it's nice to have a bit of comparison between the um, higher and lower salinity water. So how do we how do we do our survey? Um, so we take these small crates and we fill them with um, oyster shell. This is um, just dead oyster shell. And we place it in the water one meter to uh, about one meter depth, because like I said, these are shallow water crabs. And we do that for two months, they sit out there. And then we pull the crates up. Um, we look at the mud level on the crate. We looked at how much fouling and other things have grown on the crate. Um, we identify the fish. Oh, the fish, we, we put them back in the water, but the mud crabs, 
um, we place in jars and we bring back to the lab so we can look for those little sacs underneath the aprons. And um, after we've looked at everything, um, we'll put them back for the next survey um, or not, depending on what time of year it is. So that's kind of um, the survey. And the citizens that come out and help us, they are involved mostly in the sorting processing of those crates. So once we pulled the crates up, um, we need a lot of help going through all that shell, looking for the crabs and putting them into jars. So, um, like I said before, the the original survey um, for the first 10 years was very small scale. Um, but in 2014, we decided to, to turn it into a citizen science project. Um, but, you know, back in 2014, people were, some people, we're a little bit skeptical about citizen science still. It, it wasn't as popular as it is today. Um, some people wondered, well, can people really do a good job? You know, are, are they really gonna collect good data? So um, we kind of set up our, um, our program to sort of answer some of those questions. Um, so, and one of the ways that we did that is um, we worked in teams to minimize the crab misses and then we measured the data quality by, by basically using our teams. So we have, and this diagram shows we have two different teams. They're each sorting a crate and you can see on this particular day, we had a lot of volunteers. So they all are hovered around the crates and the sorting screens. And then when one team was finished, they would switch and check each other's work. And so, um, and then if you missed something that you'd put it in a separate jar and we would measure the number of crabs that were missed by each team, right? So this gave us, um, an, gave us an error, right? And so when we first started out, we had um, the help. I will just um, seeing that picture of Hilo and Flavio um, reminded me that um, we had some visiting scientists um, in 2014, the first year that we started. Um, they were out visiting from, oh, um, Brazil. And they were started sorting the crabs. And, you know, back when it was pre-citizen science, we just looked at the crates one time and, you know, you found the crabs you did and then you put it back. Well, Flavio, said, uh, I don't think that's quite good enough. You really need to look at them twice. And so we started double sorting the crates. That meant that each team would look at the shell once, then you'd dump it back on the screen, you'd look at it again, and then you'd switch. So it was, we had single sort when you look at it one time and then switch, or a double sort, you look at it twice and you switch. And then you verified it. And then we had a measure of the error rate of each of those types of activities. So in 2016, 20 and 2017, we decided to do an experiment to test which method, double sort, single sort, which one was better. And so um, we set up our experiment by, um, we standardized all the training um, and we had all the teams doing the same method for every session. And then we would switch. So one day would be a double sort day. One day would be a single sort day. Um, or we could do a single sort morning and a double sort afternoon. But everybody within the same time period was always doing the same method and they had the same training. So there was no confusion over what you were supposed to be doing for any given session. And then the initial sort was timed using a stopwatch because we could see how long each method took. And then of course we were measuring the size and the number of crabs that were missed by each team using each of the two methods. So here's the results. Um, on the right hand side is the double sort method, or uh, sorry, is the percentage of missed crabs per trap by sorting type. So double sort in blue, single sort in orange. And there was no significant difference at all between sorting type. Oh, okay. But 
um, there was a significant difference in the amount of time it took. You know, it takes longer to double sort the crate. No surprise there. Um, it actually took 10 minutes longer on average. The difference between the two, um, the median sort time is 10 minutes. Okay. So there, so, you know, double sorting doesn't give you much, but it does cost you 10 minutes on average. So then we looked at all the crate data that we had from the start of the project in 2014 up to that, up to 2018 is when I did this analysis. And I found that 73% of the time we missed less than 5% of the total crabs caught in the first sort, which I think is pretty darn great. I mean, yay, citizen science. And only 6% of the traps had error rates over 15%. Considering the number of traps, which is if you look on the graph there, um, it's kind of broken down by season, spring, summer, fall, and winter. We had a lot more traps in the summer. You'll notice that that um, sample size is 426 traps versus um, considerably fewer in the other seasons because um, most of our work is done in the summer. We just have a few traps that we that we look at year round to see if there's something interesting going on in the other seasons. But for the most part, people are great. So yay. But we did, we were curious about, all right, so that's really awesome. People are awesome. The data is really good. But what about the 32 traps in which the error rate was over 15%? Can we learn anything about those traps that might help us prevent high misses in the future? So we thought, well, maybe you could explain it if you had only a few crabs and you missed, so if you had, you know, only 10 crabs in your trap and you missed three of them, well, your error rates is a percentage, so it's high. So does, does total catch, could that explain it? And the answer is, well, no. <laughs> it doesn't. Um, so it's less than 100 catch and over 100 catch, and it's pretty much an even split. So nope, that didn't make a difference. Does uh, the sort type make a difference? Are people missing the high, you know, there's, you know, really high numbers in a single sort or a double sort? The answer is uh, nope. <laughs> evenly split between double and single sort. Um, so what we what we can, well, I've been running the project for a long time and my personal conclusion, although we don't have data to back up this, is that people miss more crabs if they're miserable, if they're hot, if they're tired, if it's 98 degrees, if you've asked them to do more crates than they really wanted to do, um, then, you know, you might miss more. And that's not a volunteer thing. That's a people thing. Staff are going to miss as many as a volunteer if they are unhappy and fatigued. Because that is the way it is um, for anyone. So, um we took this information and we made some changes to the project um, based on what we found. Um, one of the things we did is we limited the, our survey to just four hours and we only do our survey pretty much in the morning. And we do that so we can not be out there in the heat of the day. Um, Cause nobody really, you know, it's Maryland. We do a lot of this in June and August and August is bloody hot in the afternoon some days. So um, we try and be out of there by, you know, one o'clock latest. And so we, you know, start early in the day, and get it done. Um, another big change that resulted from the analysis is that um, we no longer do the verification at all. Instead, we do a double sort. It actually takes a long time to switch and verify um, a trap. You know, you got to move teams around. You have to wait until one team is finished so that you can have somebody else check the trap. And so instead of doing that verification step, what I've decided to do instead is just have everybody do one double sort. To me, it's kind of like a self-verification. <laughs> you know, you have, you have a second go 
And if you miss something, hopefully you'll find it in the second, second look. And then there's no verification. And the time that we would have spent verifying the traps, what we do is we actually sort out the female crabs with eggs. Um, because you know that Loxo is a castrator. So the very fact that the female has her own eggs means that she does not have the parasite. And so now we have time. We actually measure and release all those females in the field, but they never go into a jar or back to the lab. So that was something we never had time to do before, but uh, something that we had been able to add, which is really good. So um, in the interest of time, I know I don't have, um, let's see, what is my time? Yeah, I'm not doing too bad. Um, I wanted to give you a little sample of what we've learned so far. Um, this won't be everything that there is to learn about this project, but a little sample. Um, as you saw from the title slide, we've had 13 interns on this project, and that means we've had 13 independent research projects in addition to the primary data set, which is a lot of interesting questions that people have, have come up with and um, small projects that they've done. Um, and the first one I want to tell you about is um, one that Amanda Bevins did. Um, because her project ties in so nicely with the data I just presented. So um, this is Amanda Bevan's project. She was the June, she was an intern in, uh, it says June, 2019, but really June and August of 2019. Um, right now, um, Amanda is just finishing up her PhD at uh, Morgan State University, which is awesome. Um, but she was, Amanda was really interested in what factors contributed to those high sorting rates in the crates. And she looked at a number of factors that she thought might influence it. Um, she looked at things like um, how much biofouling there was on the crate, um, what the mud level was, was it anoxic, meaning that, you know, it's black and stinky and no crabs were in it, um, and the number of small crabs. So here's our Amanda's results um, for how the number of small crabs might impact the error rate for each um, sorting type. Um, so on the right-hand side, there's this, the count of the small crabs. These are ones that are less than five millimeters. That's pretty darn small. That's like, oh, it's a bit bigger than a, it's like the size of a boba straw opening. I don't know if you guys have had boba, can I? It's, it's almost, five millimeters gives you an idea of how big that is. So there's a small crabs. So she counted up all the small crabs um, and then she looked at um, based on um, how many were missed in the single um, versus the double. So on the, um, that would be the left-hand side is single sort <laughs> and the right-hand side is double sort. And well, it looks like there could be, you know, some kind of impact if, of uh, the number of small crabs on increasing the air rate if you just look at the crate one time. And that makes sense. Um, more crabs, the more teeny crabs there are, if you only have one shot to find them all, you might miss more. Um, she didn't find any impact for the double sort though. Um, and you'll notice that, um, in her analysis, she had um, many more crabs, many more tiny crabs in the crates that were double sorted um, than the ones that were single sorted. Um, I think we had upwards of 800 tiny crabs in one that was double sorted. That was a lot of crabs. <laughs> so that might be a factor that impacted some of her analysis, but I think she did a really nice job of kind of looking at um, how difficult the crate is versus um, what the error rates are. If the task is more difficult, the more likely it is that you miss crabs. But even with a really difficult job, people were simply not missing that many crabs because as I said earlier, citizen scientists are, scientists are awesome and they do a really great job. So um, here's another great intern project. 
So these were, this one was done by two interns in two different years. It was started by Jasmine in uh, 2018 and finished by Gabriella in 2020. Um, so from 2016 to 2018, um, we surveyed our volunteers. We asked them basic information about age, occupation, experience, and we used this information to form groups of similar age and, and experience level. And so um, Jasmine and Gabriella analyzed these data to see if there were any differences in the error rate between these groups. And error rate, um, in this case, is the percentage of missed crabs um, found during the, you know, the verification sort. And they basically um, confirmed what we had already um, sort of known, that they're that volunteers do a great job and there's no significant difference among teams based on age, occupation, um, participation in a relevant project, previous precipitate participation in the mud crop project. So there you have it. People are great. <laughs> People do a really good job, which is fantastic. So it was a really nice um, project um to sort of validate citizen science um not only for ourselves but for citizen science i think in general um especially where you had people who are a bit skeptical about um what volunteers could do in my mind this is a really great um project and really showing um that people can do a lot with just a bit of training and um you know somebody a little bit of oversight and training really and also um someone to make sure that they're having a good time you know let's not let's not work when it's really hot let's not do too much in a day you know let's make it to be a pleasant fun experience and not something that is unpleasant and you know a bit of a slog so um changing pace a bit uh, the next example I want to highlight is a relationship between solidity and the occurrence of the parasite in the upper Chesapeake Bay. So we're kind of getting away um, from the people analysis and kind of getting into a little bit of the crab parasite analysis. So a little shifting of gears. Um, so the white-fingered mud crabs... Um, so salinity, as I'm sure you all know, is just basically the amount of salt in the water. And um, there's everything that lives in estuaries has a salinity tolerance of which they prefer. They have a salinity tolerance, which is really what they will survive. And then there's a what they really like if they're going to be happy and reproductive. And so um, the salinity that it white-fingered mud crabs can tolerate is actually quite wide. They've been found reproducing in freshwater lakes in Texas, which is remarkable. Um, but they can also survive and reproduce in salinities that are close to ocean water, which is probably why they've been successful invaders themselves, invading, you know, both Europe and California, as well as other places. Um, but the loxoparasite, on the other hand, its tolerance and happiness level for salt is not quite so wide. It doesn't seem to do well and doesn't reproduce well um, at salinities that are really lower than 10 parts per thousand and above 30 parts per thousand. So it's like things a bit saltier than um, the white-fingered mud crab. Um, and so in drought years, when the salinity um, is um, over 10, you have very happy parasites. But in wet years, um, when the salinity is is lower, when it's you know less than 10 or right around 10, you don't really find very many parasites. They actually can be quite rare. So if you look at um, the number of infected crabs, and these are mature crabs, they're over four millimeters, which is the size of a crab that you can actually see the parasite on. Um, so not the tiny little ones that we don't know about, but the mature parasite, the much mature crabs that you can detect a parasite on. This is the percentage of infected crabs per year um, 
And then on that little gray line is the salinity. So um, you can see if you look at the salinity line, the salinity kind of was up in 2010, kind of goes back to its more normal range of 10 parts per thousand, the salinity um, units, that parts per thousand there on the left-hand side, and the percentage of infected crabs is on the right-hand side. So you have to kind of, this is a little complicated graph and that you have to look at two different axes to see what you're looking at. So um, that gray line, you're gonna look at the salinity, which is on the left. And you can see that when it's close to 10 or under 10, there's not very many infected crabs. But when it jumps up to 16 perch per thousand, the crabs are very happy and you suddenly have um, a lot of infected crabs. Hopefully that made sense. Um, you can ask questions at the end. Um, so here's where those sites are. Um, Cirque Doc, this is where um, Smithsonian Environmental Research Center is located. And um, this is Corn Island, it's just, just across the river. They're actually not very far apart, but they're some of our longer term sites. I just wanted to point out where they are. Um, so um, for jumping to sort of the, the road river as a whole. So one of the benefits of having all these people collecting data is our ability to increase our survey area. So this is the road river in 2015 in pink and in 2016 in gray. These are the road river sites. So each bubble is a site and the color of the bubble indicates the year. And the number in the bubble is the percentage of adult crabs, so over four millimeters, that are infected with the parasite. And if you remember, we'll just jump back a little bit and look, 2015, there were either zero crabs, zero crabs, or next to zero crabs in 2015 at Cirque Doc or um, really much in between 2012 and 2015, they're really, they're, you were hard pressed to find a parasite, really. And then 2016, salinity jumped up to 16 parts per thousand. And here they come, 0% at one site, next year, 24%. And so what we found is that um, didn't matter where you looked in the Road River, um, the parasites were there. They may have been patchy in their abundance levels, but they were pretty much across the board, back and reproductive, the soon as you had a year where the salinity was higher. And so 2023, as we know, we had low rainfall, the salinity, again, is high, and what do you know? Parasites are having a great year. So they didn't have a very good year, you know, they kind of crashed after about 2018, 2019, 2020, you were lucky to find a parasite, but 23, it's their year. So the parasites are not always present and they're not always abundant. Um, they really are kind of in line with what the salinity is doing. So it really is kind of all about rainfall for the upper parts of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, now, that's not the case where the salinity is always high. Um, you would find a slightly different story if you looked in different parts of Chesapeake Bay, um, where you have um, that kind of sweet spot as far as salinity year round. Um, yeah. So, um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to kind of go down any more rabbit holes with additional data, but, um, there is a little bit more on, online, um, if you're interested, but I do want to, um, get back a little bit to, um, citizen science and, um, 
and the benefits of citizen science. And I hope that you all, uh, I'm sure that by now you're tired of me telling you how awesome citizen scientists are, but they are in fact great. And um, this is some of the ways that they have helped us improve the project, not only by helping us with our methods, which they have actually done quite a lot of, people are great about asking questions. Well, why are you doing it this way? And if you're listening to people, you can think, well, yeah, why are we doing it that way? You're right, this way is actually better. And so they've helped us tweak our methods a little bit and find improvements. Um, they've also, because we have so many people coming in, usually about a hundred a year, sometimes more, sometimes less, but we've been able to change the scope of the survey and increase the number of traps by what used to be 40 to what's now 76, which is a big jump. And we couldn't do that if we didn't have the manpower to, to work through all those crates. Um, we can also add in a lot of other things that we would not have had time to do um, before, like counting and identifying the fish and actually doing some interesting analyses on some of the fish populations like the gobies and the blennies and the skillet fish um, and the and sort of their, the fish's reproductive health because actually fish use all those oyster shells for their own reproduction, which is kind of neat. We also added year round sampling. So most of our survey is June and August. It used to only be June and August. But then with citizen science, we could actually go in and say, well, let's take a peek at what the other seasons are looking like. And so we added in um, year round sampling at some of our sites. And some of our sites are actually off of private docks, which is great because people have said, hey, this is great. I have a dock. <laughs> so um, in the wintertime, um, that's been really helpful. We've also added um, a plankton survey um, to look at larval crabs. Um, larval crabs are called zoea. And we basically do a big survey um, of the larval crabs to see how they're moving in and out of their river systems. So that's been something that we've started recently. And we do have people, uh, volunteers come out and help with that survey occasionally. And like I said earlier, we've trained 13 interns, but we've also have a lot of high schoolers who come in and work in the lab. And um, because it's a citizen science project and people know about it, um, we've actually gotten quite a bit of money from um, private donations, which actually funds our interns. So from 2016 to 2013, 2023, we've gotten um, $73,000 in donations, um, which is which funds our interns, which is fantastic opportunity for the interns. So if you think you'd want to come out and play with us, um, our next survey is actually in December, but being that it's quite cold, she's like going to be pretty small. But uh, we'll be going at it in uh, in June and August next year and um, have some smaller scale events in um, December and February that you can look for. But if you're interested, you can sign up online to learn about when our next um, event is scheduled. There's a newsletter and email that goes out every Sunday, I believe, that tells you about all the citizen science that's happening at CERC and how you can sign up for, for what is going on. Um, to come out and help us in the field, you have to be at least 12 years old. Um, and you, if you're between 12 and 16, you have to be accompanied by a participating adult. Um, and in, to work in the lab, you have to be 16 years old. Um, so that's a hard and fast rule. So in order to help us with the lab analysis, 16 years old. And again, um, there's a link um, to a citizen science page where you can find out information about this project and the other um, citizen science projects at CERC. Um, when I started this in 2014, there was only this and archaeology at CERC, two, two relatively small projects that involve citizen science. Now, if you look at our website, there is a lot of different options. Um, as a community, CERC has been welcoming people um, 
to come and help with all aspects of research, which has been fantastic. So um, with that, I will answer any questions anybody has. Thank you, Monica. That was wonderful. And if you can put in the chat box, if you if you participated in any citizen science um, activities, I know that we've done quite a few presentations on that in, in terms of trying to be that pipeline of volunteers um, uh, to that and making sure that people know that science isn't something done by other people. Everybody can be, everybody is a scientist. Uh, it's all about just, uh, you know, finding knowledge. Uh, you can unshare, Monica, and come yep. back. Let me find that I always, like to say, you know, <laughs> I always like to say Darwin Darwin wasn't a scientist, so uh, he gets all this kind of stuff on him. Uh, let me put a spotlight on you. Do we have any questions? I know that Richard said, um, are the crabs in any real danger from the parasite? Um, sort of the short answer is no. Um, the long answer, of course, is always a bit more complicated. So um, if you're an individual crab and you get infected, yeah, you're pretty well screwed. But as a population, um, in most parts of Chesapeake Bay, as we've seen, you have years where the a parasite is really prevalent and years where it's practically absent. So um, they really have a lot of time between those outbreaks to recover. Now, um, we have seen some very short-term impacts, um, like down in Tredavon River, where we've had um, multiple years of high um, infection rates, and then you'll start to see a decrease in our catch of white-fingered mud crabs by quite a lot. Um, but then we also see it rebound. So um, it's interesting system to follow, an interesting system to learn about. Um, and I'm happy to say that there hasn't, as far as I can see, been a, a really like long-term detrimental impact to the mud crab population at large. Um, but that's not to say there hasn't been some short-term local impacts. Yeah. That's good. Um, Ted has his hand up. Go ahead, Ted. It may sound like a dumb question, but uh, of what benefit to the Bay are these little uh, mud crabs? Well, um, as Allison Kay would loves to tell people, she thinks of them as kind of the popcorn of the bay. Everybody eats mud crabs. Uh, blue crabs eat mud crabs. Blue, uh, you know, birds eat mud crabs. Anybody that can put it in their mouth and is is going to eat a mud crab. <laughs> they are food for lots and lots and lots of organisms. Okay. And on the reef, um, I think one of their benefits is that they actually do eat a lot of the um, sort of the fouling things that are on those oyster reefs. So they probably help keep the oysters that are on a reef a bit clean and not so covered in fouling. If you have all these little mud crabs basically eating the fouling that you're covered in, it's got to be helpful. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Robin. Robin has her hand up. Go ahead. So I just wanted to say that as somebody who was once an exhausted, uh, overworked grad student, not always doing my best when I was really exhausted, just the whole the whole testing you did with, I think you said the first group wasn't even citizen science. You were also doing it with some actual, you know, people that were interns studying how how do, how well are they doing in different conditions and then scientifically checking their air rate and then redesigning how you would have them do things to minimize air and then thinking about you know the comfort of the people and on all of that i mean i just can't overestimate i can't say how much that is so great and how much it's so great to um, show how citizen science can be done and just such a model for, you know, what do we need to think about, not just in citizen science, but in any kind of field work that involves difficult, I just, I'm so pleased with how you did that. That was great. <laughs> thank, oh, you. thank you. Not only really a question, I just wanted to say that was fabulous. <laughs> thank you, Robin. Um, are there, Monica, are there, I have, are the infected uh, crabs, do they, um, do they only infect, the, the LOXO only infects the crabs 
does Loxo infect any other organisms? No, um, Loxo, the, this particular species, the Loxo thylacus panopii only infects five species of um, rhizocephalin crabs, so mud crabs. Um, there's another species, and I'm forgetting the name right now, um, that impacts blue crabs. Um, luckily, it's not in the bay. Um, it is in the Gulf Coast, though. Um, and it it's basically a similar parasite that impacts blue crabs in the same way. But um, this type of parasite usually has a favored host, and it doesn't jump between, you know, species very easily. And it doesn't make the 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 mud crabs um, any less or more palatable to the food chain if the uh, infected versus non infected. Um, having not done a taste test myself, I can't say for sure, but I they seem to be eaten just the same. So, uh, Richard asks. On, online, how widely distributed throughout the Bay, Susquehanna to Atlantic, and uh, the parasite? So, um, actually, if, let's see if I had a, I might have had a map of that. Okay. Yeah, so um, the in, the introduced range is basically from the kind of the northern part of Florida all the way up through New England. That's where the Loxo parasite is introduced. Um, now the native range of the parasite is the Gulf Coast all the way down to Brazil. Um, so the um, the parasite is typically more southern, that's its native range, and it's spreading north from, it basically started, when it was introduced, it was introduced first to Chesapeake Bay, and from Chesapeake Bay, it's moved both north and south. So um, it's almost kind of, the introduced range is almost reconnecting with the sort of the northernmost native range now. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Any other questions for Monica tonight on citizen science, mud crab, Paris, uh, Loxo? I agree. I also, I can't wait to go out and start looking for these critters now. I'd love to be able to be given a, you know, I'm, I'm going to be on my hands and knees and I'm going to be excited when I find my my mud crab. Maybe we can come out and go searching with you, Monica. Yeah, they're pretty easy to find. Just pull away the bark of a down tree that's under the water, and you'll find them all lined up in there. All right, that's everybody's challenge for next for the when we get back in the water again. Everybody's going to go find mud crabs. You know, I, I definitely um, have also seen crabs in trees uh, on some of the Caribbean islands. <laughs> the different kind of crab <laughs> in the tree. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Monica. This was wonderful. And I hope that um, that uh, we can get out there and become part of it. I'd love to get out there and, and sit there and sort, sort through some of those crabs, uh, the uh, oyster shells. It's, it sounds like it would be very relaxing to me. <laughs> I would really enjoy doing that. Uh, so maybe you'll see me out at one of the volunteer days. And I hope that um, everybody here gets involved with the Citizen Science Project. There are some in the field, but there are also some online that you could do in the uh, comfort of your own home. Uh, but you're all part of the scientific uh, frontier forward because the more eyes and and brains we have on the project, the better. And we've, we're realizing that we're, 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 we're all pretty smart. We can do it. <laughs> um, it. So thanks, thanks, Monica. And thanks, everybody. We'll see y'all soon. Um, take care. Stay well. Stay curious. And stay outside. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Great show. Great presentation. <laughs>